to actually start. Hi, my name is Rory Cantor. I'm host David on Arch Talk 101, and we have Scott on the line with us, and we're going to find out what his world Archie looks like, and uh, um, we'll just kind of go from there. Have a lot of fun talking. Uh, welcome to the show, Scott. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thanks, mate. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little something about you. Well, oh, so my name's Scott Bryce uh, from Australia, live in Brisbane, um, grew up in the rural areas of Australia, um, been part of the Australian target archery scene for uh, the last 13, 14 years, um, been on the Australian team doing World Cups and World Champs and all that sort of stuff since 2013. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had my last international competition in career, and I'm now officially retired from international <laughs> competition. <laughs> well, you did it for quite a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, sucker for punishment, really. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, enjoyed it immensely. Uh, really enjoyed meeting people and, you know, the, meeting new um, cultures and going overseas and all that sort of stuff. Before that, I'd never been overseas. So archery was my first trip uh, leaving the country. Um, so it's taken me to a few places. Met a lot of nice people, even a few Americans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even a few Americans, huh? Yeah, there's a couple there. They were all right shots, you know. They, they did, yeah. did okay. <laughs> yeah. So I mentioned over over your many years of uh, uh, competing in archery, you, you've got some uh, pretty interesting stories of uh, uh, some of the events you're at. Uh, tell us about one of the uh, most memorable events that you shot at. Oh, I'm trying to think which which ones I can talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll leave the parties for another day. Um, <laughs> Um, oh, I tell, I tell, one of the most memorable actually happened to a good friend of mine. Um, I think it was 2016 World Championships in Denmark, Copenhagen. And um, it, that was the one where um, oh, it was a good friend of mine, Rio Wall. You, you guys didn't know him, um, obviously. Um, and when he put in his score sheet, his, his three looked like a two. Um, on his score sheet, so the, um, World Archery took basically a hundred points off him, and uh, oh. obviously, <laughs> so he didn't make um, finals, and you know, the team didn't make the team events, and it was a real, real weird one um, to see that happen just over someone's handwriting. Um, it was very controversial at the time. There was a lot of commentary about you know whether it was right or wrong. Um, but yeah, I, I still remember that, and um, um, I think it still stings Rio a bit every now and then because I remind him every now and then just for fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I mean, the right threes that look like twos. <laughs> yeah, threes that look like twos and twos that look like threes. But yeah, it just came down to handwriting at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, it was a, it, that was a big one to do that in a in a world championship. Um, that was a big deal back in the day. Yeah, yeah, that that would be pretty bad when you when you score so much better than than what it was just because they didn't read your handwriting right. That exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, that was a big one. But there, there's been plenty of things I've seen over the years. Like I've seen Mickey Slosher, um, you know, shoot. Was it 717? You know, only dropped three points. His first person to clean the 360. Um, I saw I was there when Rio shot the the world record, which is still there, which is that 150 with the 12 X's. Um, that was a big deal because that was the first time he'd ever shot his HBX or HBC, um, which was amazing. So it's good to be around those sort of blokes, and you you sort of hope it rubs off bit of osmosis yeah. <laughs> but um yeah seen some wild stuff seen some really good archery um 
I don't know what else is, we're seeing. <laughs> seen some crazy stuff off the off the line. Um, Americans are always up for a bit of fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're always up yeah. for fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think uh, well, Korea just gone. The uh, the boys um, rocked up in their uniforms, and underneath their uniform, they all had uh, shirts on with uh, the face of Sawyer Sullivan on it. And um, I don't, didn't get to hear the backstory on it, but it was quite funny watching them all walk around with Sawyer shirts on for a while. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. told them they should have put a uh, uh, American flag on it and then on the, and the names on the back, and they could have shot in them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. You what never know what to do. <laughs> So is target archery mostly what you did? You didn't. You, is there any hunting over in Australia? Or? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so I grew up uh, in the rural parts of um, North Queensland, um, in a small country town. Um, so yeah, I grew up hunting. I think I got my first air rifle when I was five, um, and going around killing the local toads and stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think the uh, my backyard was a no fly zone for any bird in the area. Um, <laughs> if it moved, it got shot basically. <laughs> um, but yeah, and that's where the archery first started, I suppose. You know, the old fiberglass bows in the backyard. And then um, as we got older, my dad was a very keen hunter. Um, uh, in Australia, there's not a lot to hunt. Um, we've got basically got wild pigs. You can shoot the kangaroos and stuff like that if you've got a you know a license a permission, um, especially on some of the properties where they they get into plague proportion numbers. You can get special permission to cull them, but we mainly hunt uh, wild pig, um, which is always fun on foot with a with a compound bow. Yeah, well, a bit interesting. <laughs> 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 but as we get older, we we, we I think uh, I think it was about thirty when I gave up walking around the bush with a compound bow hunting pigs, and we we just bail into the back of the truck with shotguns, and you'd get a lot more. Yeah, um, yeah, and it was a little bit easier on the on the lungs. Yeah, but um, we did a lot of hunting. Uh, there, there was a bit of deer hunting in the in the area. Um, we've got. Um, some rusa deer up there, um, but very low numbers, very low numbers. So it wasn't the biggest thing in the world to do. Um, a couple of people had them on their properties, and you know it was more of a novelty than anything else. Um, yeah, to go shoot deer. Um, it's funny now that um, that was quite a while ago, but now the deer are everywhere. Um, it's, it's quite common. We've got deer in the cities now. Um, you can even hit them with your car, <laughs> yeah. Which, yeah. which 10 years ago was unheard of in Australia. Um, yeah. Because obviously they're introduced. We'd, we didn't have deer before the colonials came and all that sort of wonderful stuff. Um, obviously, we didn't have pigs either. Um, so, yeah, a lot of feral stuff. Other stuff we hunt, we, it sounds terrible, we also hunt wild horses. The Brumbies, they get shot. Um, and we've got a lot of wild camels, a lot of wild camels in the interior camels? of Australia. Camels, camels. yeah. Yeah. I, I, never, I never thought that Australia would have had camels. Yeah, no, um, well, obviously the, the settlers brought them over way back when and uh, to go touring around the deserts in, um, to go exploring, and the population has just exploded. Um, so in the interior of Australia, which we have a fair bit of desert, um, there's camels everywhere, which is quite interesting. Um, they're, they're interesting animal to hunt because they're quite large. <laughs> yeah. Um, they stick out like a sore thumb. Um, then uh, it's one of those things, I don't think it's very sporting, if you know what I mean. Um, they sort of just stand there and look at you. Um, so it's, it's not the most exciting thing in the world to hunt. <laughs> um but you do, you're doing the, the country a favor by knocking them over. Yeah. Then what do they do with them? Do they do they eat the camel or anything? Or um, I believe they do. Um, I think some of it gets turned into pet meat. Um, quite a bit gets turned into pet meat. 
Uh, I do think they eat some of it um, as a, you know, more of a touristy delicacy thing. It's like coming over here and eating crocodile. Um, the locals don't eat a lot of it, but the tourists love the stuff. <laughs> it reminds me of that crocodile deed the movie when he eats that go and he goes, tastes like shit, but you can eat it. <laughs> yeah, that was a good movie. <laughs> yeah, that was a good movie. Um, so it's a bit like that. Um, you know, you can go to the local restaurant and eat camel if you're really keen, but I think if you saw them out in the wild, you wouldn't eat them. Um, they're pretty filthy animal. Not like your deer. Yeah, deer's a little bit different story, but I know like over here, um, you know, at the turn of the century, they never figured deer would be a viable game animal. And now they're just, yeah, they're, there's there's times when it's like, okay, how many you want to shoot? You know, just go buy yeah. another license. And, and and now they've kind of restricted them there for a while. They they had uh, pretty much unlimited um, season choice tags where you could shoot shoot two does on one tag. And now they've kind of, they, there's a limit to how many of them you can get now, but. Uh, yeah. We don't have to yeah. worry about limits. You, you can go out and kill as many as you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we got them all over. I live out in a little village, you know, in between two big cities and I don't normally see deer going through, but we had a flood here uh, not too long ago. We got about 10 inches of rain in, in one day and, and everything all flooded and, and I seen walking through my yard, I seen a deer print. It's like, well, it kind of chased them out of where they normally hang out in the trees. They were all underwater. Yeah. Now, we like it here when it uh, dries out a bit and uh, the water sources get a little bit lean and mean. Um, makes it a bit he easier to find everything because they're all going to the one water hole. Yeah. Um, when it rains in Australia, it rains properly. So <laughs> you end up, uh, instead of driving around in a truck, you're in a boat. Which makes it interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're shooting pigs from a boat. That's always, uh, I always wish I'd videotape that. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. That would be a little, <laughs> little, little more interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Full draw with a compound bow standing up in a boat. Um, yeah. <laughs> there was a bit of rocking and rolling, <laughs> trying to get everybody to stand still. <laughs> I know we we bow fish out of out of boats around here too, and um, you know a lot of them have a big old platform on them. So not only you got the boat, but you're up, you know, five ten feet up, you know, on top of yeah. the platform, so you can see down in the water and shoot pretty much, you know, a little more straight down. And and I've never hunted, I've never shot off one of those, but I always just did it from the bank. <laughs> yeah, well, I've never done the the the, the bow fishing. I've always wanted to, but um... In Australia, it, it's really hard. Like the, there's not a lot of areas where we have that carp. Um, we basically, um, most of our species uh, don't sit at the top of the water. So um, it's really only the carp you can hunt. Um, and the government love it when you, you kill those bloody things. Um, but there's only certain areas where you can find them. So it's in New South Wales, a bit further down south where it's a bit colder. Um, but up here in Queensland, <laughs> We've got nothing. I've seen a few guys take him out to the reef and try and shoot sharks and stuff with him. Um, <laughs> I reckon that's pretty wild. That'd be a bit interesting. Um, yeah. Especially hooking to a big one. Jar, <laughs> <laughs> Stand on top of the, the game boat shooting sharks. Um, <laughs> it'd be quite interesting, I reckon. Yeah. But I've always, always, you know, I've seen the shows on TV where they they go out on the airboats in America there and you, you know, got the old Matthews Genesis things with no draw. Yeah. Um, and that looks like the best fun in the world. Yeah, that that that's a pretty popular one for it. I use a recurve just just because when I get compounds in my my hand, my my mind changes on on how I shoot them. <laughs> You know, yeah. you know, like like you shoot a compound and target. You know, you go to anchor point. You know, because all that uh, recurve. I shoot it completely instinctively. I look at the target and 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 draw back and shoot at the target by like, focusing on the target. So, um, you know, I I have yet to be able to shoot a compound instinctively. <laughs> I, I just for me it it doesn't work. Uh, yeah, and, I don't think it's good either. If I'm going bow fishing, I'm going to grab my recurve and go with that one. So 
And that's what I'm going to use anyway, because it's set up for bulk fishing. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Well, it, it's funny because I shoot the same way. When I've got a compound bow in my, in my hand, there's no way I'm instinctive shooting that. Um, no. But with the recurve, it's that's exactly the way I was taught how to shoot. Just look at what you want to hit and don't think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> your, your body will learn to ad adapt to where you're going to go. And Yeah, yeah. But don't tell anybody I shoot a recurve. That I'll, I'll get shot. <laughs> 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 you're you're an archer right yeah yeah what, what's archery a stick with a string flinging another stick that's it that's it <laughs> that's a bit of funny we have we have a bit of fun over here in australia there's a, there's a fair bit of um grief given to the stick shooters um or all, all fun and games of course um we never take any of that stuff seriously but um but yeah it's, it's always the old jokes about us having training wheels and and yeah, they're the real arches and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it does take a little more skill to shoot, you know, a, a bare bow with no sights, just just you and the bow. <laughs> oh god, yeah. Oh god yeah. Um, that's like the three D guys who do that. You know, they shoot bare bow three D and I just look at them and go, <laughs> <laughs> You're guessing the distance and you got no sights. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they all do a song and dance when they actually hit foam <laughs> yeah yeah i don't i don't shoot a long ways with my recurve because i just don't spend the time to uh, to get good enough at it to do that but you know bow fishing is you know five ten feet normally <laughs> yeah well that, honestly it'd be something if i do ever get over to america and i promised i would um i, th I think i'm actually going next year for the vegas indoor Oh yeah, um, yeah. Got to go do that. It's it's funny. I've been shooting international archery for ten years, and I've never done Vegas. Um, it's it's the funniest thing. I, I'm not a big fan of indoor. I think it's extremely boring. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. spend thirty seconds shooting your arrows, and then five minutes scoring it. <laughs> um, it's it's quite social, I reckon. But um. No, I want to get up there and um, get out there and try and do it. And while I'm over there, I was going to annoy a few people and see if I can go bow fishing and do a few other bits and pieces. Yeah, the, the bow fishing is right about, you know, in about this time is when it's it's really good. Especially when the cotton trees are starting to drop their cotton. is It's a good time, early season. Okay. And can you do it anywhere in the States? Or is there certain places that are better than others? Or um. You know? We'll have to find the nearest bayou. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, pretty much any of the lakes that have carp in them are good. Yep. Uh early earlier season, they're they're more up on top of the water. You know, later season they're down under the water. Uh, so you yep. don't see them as well. Um, so you know, you know, this this time and you know, May, May, June time frame would be your better time to come because that's when the more in the spawning and they're going to be up and in, in the top water is a little bit more so later in the season i don't see them on the top too often but you know yeah and you do it at night time too you spotlight them or is that just um well i think most of them do it during the daylight okay um, and i've got a few guys that i know that that go out and do a lot of um you know bow fishing and there's there's tournaments they catch them and there there's guys that just go out and catch you know, you know catch them I guess you shoot them but <laughs> there's <laughs> there's a lot of them now if you want to challenge the the Asian carp those are the ones that jump as you take your boat going to high they'll jump actually jump into your boat I've seen those yeah I've seen those. now that, that would like be yeah that would that'd be a challenge because because they're jumping you got to shoot them when they're moving you know it's like 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 you're on a trap team, it's like pull. <laughs> Except you're not saying pull; they're just jumping whatever they want. Yeah, I've seen a few videos like that where the boys are sitting up there with um, their uh, recurve bows at the back and just just having fun. Um, that looks like great fun. But geez, that Asian carp, that stuff's everywhere, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's. I don't know how it got started, but it's just kind of taken over because they're real invasive fish and uh, you know a lot of the rivers have them and when they're in the rivers they're just all over the place 
And, mm -hmm. you know, I, with those flooding we had, um, we flooded into our ball field down here in a village that I, I'm, I'm at. And my wife mows for the village. And you, she found a couple of dead carp on the ball field. So she just kind of threw it over in the cornfield next to it, let it fertilize the cornfield. <laughs> <laughs> Makes good fertilizer for your gardens. Well, I can imagine. I don't think that'd be very tasty, would that? Uh, carp. I've had carp that fixed, and, and I fixed it one time. I forget what I smoked it with. Um, I, I think maybe a flowering plum or a plum or something like that. And I was like, man, this tastes like ham. <laughs> Smoked carp is good. Okay. And, uh, there, we had one place here that used to fix a lot of carp. And what they do is they'd score them where all the bones are at. And then they'd yep. fry it. So then all the place they scored it was just fried and crisp, and it's like, yeah, you can just flay them out and get rid of the bones. Okay, I, I've done that when I did them. I just flay them out, and get rid of the bones. It's it's basically the same bone structure like a walleye. Yeah, and everybody likes the walleyes. They don't think it's a problem the bones, but a carp. I say the bones are a problem. I'm like, well, <laughs> flay around them. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I can't say I've ever, ever eaten carp. We're we're a bit spoiled here in Australia for um, sport fish and stuff like that. So we all eat barramundi. <laughs> oh yeah, well <laughs> you, you're kind of surrounded by water there, aren't you? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. We love our water. <laughs> it's all but we do, especially up there north. You know, you got there if you're in the, it's you know if you're in the central part of Australia, you're, you're a little ways away from from the ocean. But you know, in the bordering ones, yeah. Yeah, you're not going to well, be that far from the water. Get some good fresh seafood. Yeah, we're not far away at all. Um, well, yeah, we all, most most of the population lives on the east coast. Um, I think 15 million out of the 20 million that are in the whole country. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, no, we. You talk to the um, you know guys and girls overseas, and they all think we've got pet kangaroos and uh, live on the beach and. <laughs> Um, you know, we come home, have a quick surf, pat our koala, and <laughs> and uh, do stuff like that. It's quite funny, but um, not quite what really happens, huh? No, no. Mind you, the kangaroos are everywhere. That's that is one thing that is true. <laughs> you can't you can't walk ten meters around here without seeing a kangaroo. But um, it's funny everyone's um fascination with kangaroos. You go overseas and everyone wants to know about the bloody kangaroos. <laughs> I'd say, well, how do they taste? <laughs> um, they're a bit gamey, actually. Um, I'm trying to think what it it doesn't compare to anything else. It, it, it's quite a gamey flesh, and there's um it's very lean, extremely lean. There's 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 no fat on a kangaroo. Um, I think it must be because of all the, the jumping and running around they do. Um, but it's quite funny, and then you see wallaby meat, which you know people think wallabies are the same as kangaroos, and um, the meat on the wallaby is the exact opposite. It's it's a really um, um, uh, fatty meat. Um, I can't say I've eaten it, but just the smell puts you off. Oh yeah. Uh, whereas you know kangaroo, you, you you know you take a chunk of that and it looks like prime beef. <laughs> Um, I don't know, but yeah, it's. I suppose it's a little bit like venison. Venison's got that little gamey taste to it, but um, you know, kangaroos are taste all by itself. I'll uh, I'll have to send you some, mate. I'll cry freeze it and send it over. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, that'd be an interesting. Uh, yeah, I'd try it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I can work something out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It'll probably send your uh, customs guys into a meltdown. <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah, you never know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably get nasty letters from the U.S. government. That'll be fantastic. <laughs> yeah. It's just you're just you're just shipping back some meat, right? <laughs> yeah, just shipping some meat over. It'll be fine. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> they do it all over the world. I know we ship. Um, Alab um, what do you call it? I'm trying to think what you guys call it. We call it um, abalone. Um, 
it's like a muscle. Um, and we send that stuff live to Japan, literally. Oh, yeah. On a plane at eight o'clock that night, and it's in Japan, you know, five, six hours later. So I'm sure I can get some frozen kangaroo into America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'd, we'd, we'll have to try that. And being, being a lean meat, just like with venison, you, you can't cook them high heat. Done. Well done. They've got to yeah. be medium rare at best yeah uh, the the best piece of venison i had was i had I, I i killed a deer and i pulled out the tenders and i stuck them on the grill and i'm waiting for them to get done and you know kind of roll a bit because they always taper down it's like okay stuck a fork on the tip cut it off and ate it off the four corners yeah and <laughs> then it's like okay is that guy cooked i cut it off and ate it <laughs> okay so i mean it right off the grill <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and kangaroo is the same. You sort of just wave it over the grill, you know, <laughs> walk it past, and then uh, it's done. Um, you don't want to overcook it; it turns into a real chewy, chewy mess. Oh yeah, I I don't like any steak overcooked. It's just too hard to eat. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, I think everything that comes out of this house is uh, medium rare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it should be. There's there's no reason to have it well done. Uh, no, no. Some of the wives of some of the boyfriends and girlfriends, well, some of the wives get it their way. They just want it black on the inside and the outside. So, yeah. What can you do? And then you get those. It's like, okay, three seconds on each side, done. Like, I yes. like it's just a little bit more than that, but yeah. depending on how thick it is, too, you know? Yeah, that, no, I'll, I'll, I've got some mates who'll take an inch steak and, uh, yeah, they're just eating it raw. They call it blue. I go, no, mate, that's raw. <laughs> <laughs> blue, yeah. <laughs> I've heard him call it before. It's like, I want it blue. I'm like, blue. Uh, no, didn't that mean it's moldy? <laughs> <laughs> well, see, we do that in Australia. Any, any redhead's called blue. I don't know why. <laughs> oh. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We just call our wool our redheads bluey or or carrot top or something like that. Being Australian, we've what is it? What's the saying? It's not bullying if the whole country does it. Oh yeah. <laughs> that that, well, that that would be if the whole country does it. Then I guess it's not bullying. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not bullying. <laughs> PC hasn't quite got over here yet. <laughs> yeah, good. Hopefully, it never does. No. Oh. No, I see some of that stuff. We've got a few every now that, that jump up and down and um, mostly the coppers just taser them and lock them up. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All those people with uh, what are identifiers. I, I think anyone who identifies as a cat or a dog or anything like that, we should just take them out and hunt them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, they're 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 sick, you know. When your dog or cat gets sick, you put them you, you put them down. It's like okay, uh, you want to be a dog? Okay, uh, I think you're sick. Here you go, put yeah. you down. <laughs> yeah, we we'll put you down. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys are taking it to a whole new level, though. The stuff that you guys have to put up with. Oh my god, <laughs> where all those crazies come from? Yeah. Yeah, they, they they're they're showing up here, and I think they're they're multiplying like rabbits. <laughs> you guys got to do something about that. <laughs> yeah. I think I think they're starting to get that way where uh, people are just aren't putting up with them anymore. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like okay, you know, like I'm sitting in the middle of a high a freeway, you know, blocking yeah. traffic. You know, about times they, they run out in front of them and they get hit a few times. Uh, uh, they're not going to stand out in front of there. Yeah. Well, we had a couple of those stop oil processors and literally I think they did it once or twice here in Brisbane. And the locals didn't even wait for the cops. The local like, first guy on the line just got out of his car and started dragging them to the side, beating the crap out of them. <laughs> <laughs> they're all yelling for the cops to help them and save them and stuff and the cop was just taking their time <laughs> <laughs> yeah and he goes like oh i didn't see nothing yeah, nah. yeah. 
You're yeah. creating a hazard. I'm going to arrest you for creating a traffic hazard. Yeah, yeah. Well, they stopped. They tried to stop all the big rigs getting into the um the oil um refineries and stuff near the ports, and the truckers just got out of their trucks and beat the crap out of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're interfering with their job. They're costing them money. Yeah. It's not over yeah. there, but over here, a trucker gets paid by when his wheels are moving. He gets paid. Yeah. If wheels aren't moving. He don't get paid. So no. while he stopped, he ain't getting paid. He's costing him money. Because yeah. now then he can't deliver that load and go do another load. Yeah. Well, and the trouble you guys have got, you got, you know, you look sideways at someone, you get sued over there. Around yeah. here. <laughs> like I said, if the whole country's beating you up, <laughs> it's not bothering <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's getting pretty bad that way sometimes where you, you, you don't know what you're going to run into. So you always got to be prepared. Yeah, definitely. Well, you guys are lucky. You can have guns and carry them around in your pockets and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. Our, our government's not that lenient around here. <laughs> yeah. That's... Yeah, that's that's what they're, they're trying to make us go that way. But it seems like there's a few people in there that are really taking it the other way. And our, our Supreme Court has, has started ruling um, in, in the according to the Constitution and against all these anti-gunners and yeah, that's why I carry something like this. It's an OC spray. Oh yeah, just yeah, just a little thing that just clips in your pocket, and you just put the lever up and push the button, and nice little stream of OC spray comes out and burns their <laughs> eyes. And that's awesome. See, say, we, we say, don't even know that stuff. Um, a lot of us do, but um, you know, you get caught with it, you're in a bit of trouble. Um, yeah, we got silly rules around that sort of stuff um even with home defense like i've got a baseball bat beside my front door um because i was told if someone broke in and i went and got the baseball bat from someone out somewhere else in the house then it's premeditated whereas yeah. if it's just there <laughs> beside the door it's not <laughs> <laughs> so you, so you're a baseball fan you have lots of baseball bats right oh yeah yeah all yeah, over yeah. the house <laughs> <laughs> everywhere <laughs> <laughs> nice right here you know you, you can keep the guns right you know right handy whatever you want andy and and you know until this last uh, couple of months I, if i left the house I always had my gun on me but, yeah so lucky there um, yeah that, oh, april 11th had a triple bypass so i can't i can't shoot right now so um if i was to shoot my handgun uh, i'd be back in, in surgery stitching my chest back together <laughs> So oh. it's like I don't even care because I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're gonna be real. You're gonna be almost dying. All right, okay. This, this is worth yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's it. It had been a long road. I I kind of took a little time off doing podcasts just because trying to recover from everything, and I was yeah. like, I got to start doing them. These are fun. <laughs> <laughs> I like talking to archers all over the world and and you know I've talked to archers from all over the world and 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 it we all have kind of the same same stories, different stories, but I mean the same, you know, same thing. It's just, you know, a, a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, honestly, that's why I used to go overseas and get flogged all the time. Um <laughs> <laughs> it's just you know, hanging out with a bunch of people, you know. Being Aussies, we're always giving people a hard time, so that was always good. And and then you know people get to know us after a while, and they're giving it back. And you know there's always a bit of a bit of shit being flung around, so that's always good fun. Um, but yeah, oh, very rarely do you find I haven't met any um, um, what would I call them? Because you've got kids listening. <laughs> <laughs> nice people <laughs> everyone's usually quite friendly and quite nice and you know there's not many dirtbags in the in the community well that, that i see anyway especially in the target archery stuff um i'm sure out in the hunting community there might be some strange people you'd run into but um but yeah when you're shooting up uh on the international line everyone's quite nice yeah it, most of you hear of 
you hear of a few people once in a while, you know, that are just kind of like douchebags or whatever you want to call yeah, them. Yeah. They're just, yeah. they're just, they're just not nice people to be around. And, and I, I one guy I was, I was talking to on, on the podcast is he was struggling with something. A guy he was shooting against was helping him. Really? Yeah. Yeah, the guy he was shooting against was, you know, he was a little bit better shot, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, he was struggling with something, and the guy was sitting there helping him, helping him through some of his problems. Yeah, you know, and, and no, listen, we, we do that against you. Yeah, but you see that all the time. Like, I had a competition not so long ago, just a state one, and there was some guy's first one. So his coach said, "You know, can he shoot on your target?" And I went, "Yeah, fine, no worries." And just talking through it because he was so nervous he could barely load his bow. Oh, uh, <laughs> and you know it was just a state tournament, just you know, just a grub. You know, for most of us, we'd done it a thousand times, and but this poor fella, he was he was dying. But you know, we just kept joking with him and laughing with him and giving him <laughs> the Australian way. We're giving him shit about shaking and <laughs> shooting <laughs> fires. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, and he calmed down, I suppose, didn't he? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I think, oh, mate, I think you shot another five. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it came good. But, um, you know, you see it over the international stuff. You know, guys break a bow and the guy beside you will just hand you his and all that sort of stuff. You know, that happens all the time. A lot of times bows don't, don't arrive. You know, lost luggage is a huge thing. Oh uh -huh. yeah, it's it's number one up there when you go overseas. You know what are you going to do if your bow doesn't arrive? Because a lot of the times it doesn't, um, and the whole community gets together. Yeah, you know, you'll get arrows from this person and you know that person, and the, you know you make friends for life just because you borrowed the bow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's like, that's why you need to ship a bow over and then take one with you. So maybe one of them will show up. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we always had the plan that uh, you know you'd give you take two bows, you give one to your mate, and he'd give you one of his, and then you got a fifty fifty chance of you know someone's bag arriving. But um, of late, the uh, like um, the Australian team is from all over the country, so <laughs> there's like six hours of flight time between some of us. Um, oh, yeah. Which, which makes training a bit difficult, but um, you just can't do it. So I'm the only bloke in Brisbane at the moment in the team. Well, it wasn't the team. Um, and then, you know, there was a couple of people in the middle of the country and a couple of people at the other end of the country. Um, so it's quite interesting when you when you got that dynamic. Um, you can't do things like that. We sort of catch up, you know, in Singapore. We, we all end up in the same flight from Singapore to wherever we're going. Uh, which is it's always funny because it takes us 24 hours to get anywhere from this country oh yeah i imagine you know australia is just kind of stranded out there in the middle of the ocean yeah we, we, we're literally in the middle of nowhere so you know when we do the asian shoots it's not too bad but it's you know it's still 12 hour flight you know to the northern hemisphere and then um but if we go to the States or to Europe or something, it can be 24 or 36 hours of travel time. And uh, then you get there and you've got to shoot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you don't want to go too early because then you got to figure out what to do for that whole next day to recover and just shoot and go, right? Oh, yeah. it's You always do the math backwards on the plane and trying to work out when you're sleeping, when you're not sleeping and and, and all that sort of stuff. You know, and you you, you got to do the the homework with your sleeping pills, and make sure they're not banned, or or uh, you're going to end up getting a drug test and getting done for cheating or something like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you got to make sure your sleeping tablets are all right. But that, and that but that's the fact of life. That's how you got to do it. Is um, you can't get there a week before. Well, you can if you want to uh, pay another week's worth of. Um, accommodation but you know it just doesn't work that way yeah you got you got to take off an extra week you got to pay for an extra week of staying there and um 
you know, I could see, you know, a day or two just, you know, get acclimated to the time zone, but. Yeah, that's basically all you can do. Um, we're a bit lucky because most of the comps, and I don't know if this is a me thing or a, an Australian thing, but if we go anti-clockwise around the planet, um, we don't get um, jet lag. But when we go clockwise, we do. So <laughs> that, that's that weird. <laughs> I don't know if that's a me thing or, uh, but yeah, if I fly to Europe, when I get there, I don't get jet lag, but um, on the way back, I do. Um, it's it's quite strange. That's weird. Unless the fact that you're you're going back in time, your time yeah. zones are decreasing or coming, you're actually losing an hour, hour, two hour, whatever the time zone changes are. As opposed yeah. to gaining more time, I don't know because oh, no. well, it, it's weird. It's weird. It's it's really weird, but it, yeah, but yeah. I, I usually don't get jet lag until I get home, but um, you know, I haven't been to America, but I've been to the islands, you know, like uh, Tahiti and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I get jet lag going there, which is a bit weird, but none on the way back. Thing about international archery. So you're learning something new every day, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just never even thought about that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> things you do, things you do. Yeah, because sometimes so you, you just can't stay up. Or... Sorry? Sometimes you just can't stay up the hours to sleep at the regular sleeping time when, when you get there. Because then you're oh, just too tired. <laughs> like I'm well in my 50s now. I'm I'm in bed by 8.30. <laughs> yeah, I, I got you by a few years. Ah, oh, that's all right. <laughs> well, that was one of, the, one of the reasons I retired. I think my last competition, I was the I was seven years older than my nearest competitor in age. And I went, oh, it's time to give it a go, give it away. It's a young man's sport, that target <laughs> archery. These kids now shooting, the scores they're shooting, it's just amazing. Oh yeah, it's you know I can remember you know when when I was you know many years ago, uh, you know you could win a three hundred tournament, um, you know two ninety five two ninety eight, you know you could you were you were, you know two ninety eight sometimes maybe two ninety nine it would be the winning score. <clears throat> now if you don't get three hundred, you're not even you're not even in the running. No. No, now, if you don't, you don't get three hundred, and then you, you got to get, you know, out of the sixty X's, you you're, you you got to get at least fifty X's in order to even really, you know, take first place. You know, two ninety nine yeah. puts you in last place almost. Yeah, yeah, you don't even make the cut anymore. Yeah. Um, and and that's the same with the seven hundred, you know, this the seven twenty stuff. Like when I first started, seven hundred was the was the benchmark if you were shooting around 700 702 yeah you know, you're an archery god <laughs> um yeah yeah you just you know and 690 or something like that was you know the rest of us you know the, the us mere mortals were in the 690s somewhere um and um now i think on my last comp uh if you didn't shoot 700 you barely didn't make the cut and I think the top 15 shooters were 713 and above. So the benchmark's not 700 anymore, it's 710. If you're not shooting 710, you, you're wasting your time. It's yeah, it's, and it's just amazing. And I've always wondered why, though, because, you know, I, people obviously get better and better and better. And it, it's always been hard for the Australians and a few other teams, like because we are amateurs. Well, you know, I've got a job. I work, you know, five days a week, you know, forty hours a week, all that sort of stuff. And then we train afterwards. Where you know, you've got the Mikey Sloshers and all those sort of boys who just shoot every weekend. You're always hard up against that. But and I don't think it's the technology either. I, um, I think it's all that stuff around, you know. The, your mental awareness and how people train their brains nowadays. Um, yeah, some of these it's just switch off. Yeah, it's it. <clears throat> it's not as much the bow. Oh, the bow technology has gotten much better. Yeah, you know, yeah. so that gives you an advantage. But 
you take a top shooter, they can shoot on a low end bow or high end bow and still win with it. it yeah. It's all the technique that they learn. And, you know, when, when I first started, you know, it was like, you know, fingers, you just kind of hold your finger, just open your fingers. Well, that's not consistent. You've got uh -huh. different techniques to do. Uh, so the, the training techniques have gotten better. And the relationship just pulled the trigger. You, well, you don't do that anymore. No. <laughs> you you no. know, the, the first time I heard a back tension release, the guy was talking about it. And I was like, well, how do you know when it's going to shoot? Well, <laughs> the key is you don't want to know when it's going to shoot. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And, and then when I went through in 95, I went through and, and learned the back tension and, you know, become an archery instructor, NFA archery instructor. And, you know, I spent many years in martial arts uh, in, in Hapkido, which is a lot of techniques similar to what we're doing. And so I incorporated my martial arts training in with the archery and I kind of combined them into one. So I have a little bit different way of teaching and you know, then when I teach them, of course, I, I'm going to tell you why I want you to do it this way. Mm. You know, you get some of the coaches will say, well, do this. Oh, well, <laughs> why? Because that's what you need to do it. Yeah. No, it's not. So I teach one way and then I modify it depending each person different. You know, yeah. your, your technique for shooting your compound bow uh, is going to be slightly different than mine. Even though we're oh, yeah. both using back tension release, we're going to do a little bit different. You know, there's yeah. a slightly difference in the way we're going to do things. And, and yeah. that's that's where, you know, over the years of teaching not only martial arts, but archery, you know, you kind of learn us, OK, this isn't working. I can't keep telling you to do the same thing. Let's figure out something different. Yeah. And and you can you can teach people how to do something in multiple different ways. <clears throat> oh, for sure. Actually, it's, it's interesting about the martial arts because uh, my wife was big into martial arts and um, second day in black belt actually. And um, did it for years and years and years. And I think it was about two years ago, she retired from the from the martial arts. Um, you know, hit 50 and the body just couldn't handle it anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and she, she what, took what up art. What art did she take? Sorry? What art, what art did she take? What was she studying? Uh, she, she was a um, karate. Karate, okay. Yeah, so, um, or some form of karate. Um, I'll get in trouble for not knowing. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, so two years ago, she took up um, archery just to come and annoy me. Um, so I didn't have any time to myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, it's, it's quite funny because she knows where her body is and she's very um, aware of wherever all the bits and pieces are. Um, she is extremely good at archery. Um, you know, she's not world class or anything like that, but you know, she came straight out of the gate, you know, straight as a you know solid six fifty shooter, um, and she's just getting better and better and better. Um, and that's all to do with the martial arts. You know, when I tell her that you know you need to put your elbow back here a little bit more, and she knows straight away um, what to do and how to do it, and it actually goes a long way because um, you get a lot of people because I coach all the young ones and. Um, it's it's hard sometimes because they just don't know where their body is and uh have right. no idea. <laughs> well, and, and that's why lots of times I'll have them shoot their eyes closed. You know, get close enough they they're they're not gonna miss the backstop. And yeah. and close your eyes because with your eyes closed, your mind yes. can see what your body's doing. You open your eyes and you your mind can't see what your body's doing. You know, it could be yeah. playing all over, you won't see it. <clears throat> yeah. And your yeah. wife, the martial arts training, she can picture where her body is without closing her eyes. And yeah. that's what helps. Okay, here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do. And and she can pick it up. And, uh, you know, when, when I stay, take somebody new, I ask them if, you know, if they're an adult, generally, <clears throat> a lot of kids haven't had it, but I say if they have any martial arts experience. And if they, they say, yeah, they say, okay, the pressure you're putting on the bow is a heel palm strike. Mm -hmm. Because the heel palm it strike is done with yeah. this part of the hand, not over here or over here because it turns the hand. That's yeah. connected clear through your whole shoulder. That's what you're pushing with. And and then, you know, it's like, okay, I don't have to try and explain it to them because they know that technique. And, yeah. you know, it just saves me a whole lot of hassle. 
um, trying to explain to them, you know, the the way the work it works. And lots of times I'll take, okay, push on here, then move the hand over here. It's, or your hand wants to turn and wants to turn. You can't do that. Here's where your force is. And you know, yeah. I, I go through do a lot of explaining and <clears throat> yeah. I went I went out to Cabela's not too long ago and and uh, uh they don't have anybody there that knows anything about archer really. And and I'm teaching the one guy, he's like, oh, he's having trouble. So I'm like, where do this, do this, this. Oh, oh, that's what you're talking about. <laughs> so I got the guy that's supposed to be teaching how to shoot when you buy a bow, <laughs> how to actually <laughs> shoot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I use a lot of shooting analogies with mine because um, obviously a lot of people shoot. And I was an ex-pistol shooter before I was a bolt, uh, um, compound or archery thing. Um, and a lot of the pistol shooting goes across, obviously, because, um, you know, stand there and your, your hand's waving around and, you know, while you're squeezing off the shot, you know, I do a lot of that Um well, explain to people who, if they've shot a gun before, you know, have you ever done it not on a bench, <laughs> you know, standing yeah. up or, you know, and the thing's bouncing around, what do you do? I mean, archery's the same. You sort of just, you know, squeeze the trigger and, or, you know, whatever they're shooting, you know, you're not just yanking on the thing. And uh, a lot of people get that when you start talking to them about that sort of stuff because they think you just put it up and, I must admit, I I punch. <laughs> I punch like a spider. Um, <laughs> not as bad as Lutzi or uh, Mr. Gillingham, but um, uh, I would definitely command shoot. And it, it, it's a funny thing since I've retired, the uh, Australian coach is still working with me and um, he's basically taken all my thumb triggers off me and I'm, all I'm left with is one hinge. <laughs> <laughs> Can't punch a hinge. <laughs> so at the ripe old age of 53 I'm, I'm, I'm starting to shoot a hinge <laughs> um, which is quite funny um, we spent a couple of hours yesterday working on it and uh, I don't like it <laughs> but it's funny because I, I teach people the right way to shoot and they, you know, I always have the conversation with them I said don't shoot like I do do as I say not as I do <laughs> you're right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a little little bit harder because they're they're watching you to get the clues and yeah yeah okay, don't watch me <laughs> and all the other coaches are the same they get they catch the kids standing behind me watching me and they're going no no move along move along don't watch him <laughs> <laughs> don't watch him he don't do it right <laughs> yeah. he, he's told we can't teach him new tricks <laughs> yeah well, I say, oh, you know, I turn around and go, well, it's working for Lutzi, so <laughs> there must be something in it. <laughs> and Tim's done all right, so come on. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a place in the world for punches. Yeah, yeah it's called a boxing ring. <laughs> <laughs> I just tell him you've got to be very mentally strong to be a puncher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, that t dreadful t target panic streak comes in. Well, am I allowed to say target panic on this channel? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> if you're pulling the trigger, you're going to have target <laughs> panic sooner or later. <clears throat> yeah. Well, like Rio always trigger. Said, yeah. <laughs> Rio always said that everyone's got target panic in some form or another. Um, and if they don't, they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's why you know, back tension release. You're not pulling the trigger, putting pressure on it, and you don't know what's going to go off. You can't have target panic. <laughs> no, apparently, apparently, I'm, I found out yesterday I'm really good at punching a release eight though. <laughs> <laughs> Sit there and give it the big old flick. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, you're not allowed to do that either. Oh. It, it, yeah. <laughs> so how do you how do you shoot your because i know there's different ways of setting up um uh, a back tension off so you know as the the veteran archer who's just trying <laughs> a hinge for the first time I, I was trying yesterday that um relaxing my fingers while pulling obviously but um also relaxing a little bit at the same time um seemed to work for me a little bit 
Um, also tried the what I call the Brave and Gallant team, where you you hang on to the he's, he hangs on to his thumb button still, and um, I think he basically sets it off with his little finger. Um, and that's still pulling the trigger if you're using the little finger. Well, that's what I was thinking too. Yeah, <clears throat> and and I found with the even with the relaxing of the fingers, you could almost you know relax your pointer finger. And the thing went off, and I'm going. Well, all I'm doing is just using something else to trigger the button. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, what what I recommend is doing... go off by doing that. You know, pulling these yeah. two things, and it went off. I'm going. Oh, this is cool. I'll just do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what what happens is, if you're using your fingers to find motor yeah. skill. Yeah, aiming is a fine motor skill. Humans can't do two two fine motor skills at the same time. Yeah. So while you're aiming, you can't move your fingers. As soon as you start moving your finger, what are you thinking about your finger? Yeah. It's not aiming anymore. So now what yeah. are you aiming at? You're not aiming. You're just pointing. So what I would do with the hinge, well, that's the same thing I do with the, the handheld I use, is you mm -hmm. know when you're drawing back, you got to really exaggerate going forward. So it yep. don't go off on you as you're drawing back. Yeah, yeah. Once you yeah. get to your anchor point, now then you, you're gonna now you're gonna put it up straight and now just pull back. I don't know if you can see very well, but pull back this way, kind of like yeah. push that elbow back. And, and pushing it. it back, it's it's gonna drop down. And that's yeah. the motion right there. Nothing moves on your hand. Then you're gonna start it because what you're gonna do is aim, start pulling back and continue aiming. Because you can use yeah. your big muscles while you're aiming. So then you're not right. using your fingers or anything else. And that process rotates that that release over and makes it go off. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. See, punching is so much easier, though. If you just have your... Th <laughs> 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 I, I used to have my triggers so light that if I shook it, it went off. And uh, I could still manage to wrap my thumb around it. People never worked out how I did that. And but because it was so fine, um, I basically used the force to set it off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, my, my son has a light trigger on his, and I can't shoot it. I I have a Carter chocolate addiction. I've had it for several years. And I have the heaviest spring you can put in them because yeah. I want that trigger to be hard. Because I, yeah. I take I on I put my thumb, I put pressure on the part of the release. That, you know, those handheld ones, they have that little knob on them. I yep. took mine off because I bury the trigger right right in my hand where my thumb meets my index finger. And now yeah. then I, I bury it pretty deep into my hand. And now then I can just pull back and it will go off. Now, yeah. if I wanted to, I could just tighten my fist up and it'll go off because I've yeah. got it in there that tight. If I just make a fist, it'll fire. You know, if I'm hunting and I have to, have to do it, I, but I still use the back tension even when I'm hunting. <clears throat> well, <that's... laughs> yes, because that's what I use for when I hunt. Because nice about yeah. it is it hooks to my loop, and I just let it hang on my bow. I don't yeah. have to look at it to hook my release up. I just find the string, put the string between my my middle and ring finger, and slide down, grab the release, and I go. Yeah. I can. I don't have to look at my bow. Yeah. No, that's a... Yeah. <laughs> I must admit, I've only ever bow hunted pigs, and I've always used a wrist when I go bow hunting, only because I don't have time to, you know, muck around with when the pigs are coming at you. Um, <laughs> I'm sitting there going, squeeze, squeeze. <laughs> 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 it's put the pig in the thing and punch the crap out of it. <laughs> now, I still it fire my, my wrist strap with a back tension, but I put the trigger on, on the, the, second joint and then yeah. I just put pressure on it and still pull through and still yeah. goes off. Yeah, yeah. And, and, mm -hmm. and a lot of the good wrist like there were a couple of good wrist shooters, wrist strap shooters in target archery, and that's exactly what they did. Um you know they basically just wrap their finger around it and and use it as a back tension. It was great. Um there was a South African Patrick Rue did that. Um and he's still shooting I think. And I don't, don't think he's retired just yet. Um and there was yeah quite a few that did did Martrillis, he was really good at it. Um he's from your way, Canadian boy. Um 
and um, who else was there? Um, Sergio Pane, the he's now coach for the Indian guys. He's really good at it. Um, so yeah, it goes to show if you if you've got skill and you know what you're doing, you can make anything work. That's why I um, always laugh when people go, oh, you know, this bow, that bow, you know, you you can only shoot a Hoyt, you can only shoot a Matthews or a PSE. It doesn't matter. They're all pretty much the same. If you you know what you're doing, they all work. Right. <clears throat> you know, a top shooter, you know, that Matthews was real good at paying a lot of extra cash if you win with their bows. Yeah. <clears throat> so a top shooter a professional shooter that that's their job is to make as much money as I can shooting a bow, which one are you going to shoot? Yeah, I'm going to shoot the one that money. pays me extra money when I win. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. Know? So yeah. that's good marketing ploy. You know, are they the best bow? No. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? You know, it, are they get good bows? Well, yeah. Pretty much all the manufacturers out there now are pretty much make bows that are you know really good uh yeah. if they have a lower end entry level one you know they're they're entry level bows you know they're, yeah. they're not they're not finished as nice and pretty and um you know they don't come with you know your your top end release uh sights and rests you know they come there your top bows don't come with anything except the bow yeah, exactly. there's no rest no sights on it then because if I'm going to be buying one of the top end bows, I don't want them to pick the site I want. I want to pick the site I want. Yeah, I'm going to pick exactly. the rest I want. Um, now, I, I do recommend new it's archers. <laughs> I do recommend new archers getting good quality releases. Mm -hmm. I was helping out here in Nebraska. They had uh, become an outdoor woman. Uh, the a friend of mine, she teaches that. And I was helping her with the archery. And you know, I was still teaching them, you know, to put the finger on the, on the trigger and then pull the hand through. But they, the releases they had were so bad, they moved probably a quarter of an inch before they fire. You can't do back tension on one of those. It's too much travel. So she just had to, you know, just, you know, you can still do that, but you're going to have to pull through with your finger as you're doing it. You know, that's why I say spend the money. Don't, don't buy them cheap $20, $30 releases. They're, no, yeah, you got to. They don't even work as a backup. And uh, and buy the good stuff. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of them. Um, you know, um, Scott makes some really good wrist straps. Um, I've got one I bought from a guy back in the '90s, and it has a hook on it, and I, I still have it, still use it. You know, that's mm. the one I go to when it's really cold out because here in Nebraska, you know, it, you might be out in, in below freezing temperature and I'm not grabbing this hunk of, of aluminum with my bare hand, basically, because my glove <laughs> I use that it has basically just a little bit on the back of my hand and a little bit on the palm of my hand. Other than that, it's just so it's it's one of those fingerless ones that they have the finger to gone in them. But it's so, so beat up because I need to be able to feel the trigger. And when it gets really cold, I can't do that. It's, then, then I go with the wrist strap, and the only thing I need yep. is my my index finger out. <laughs> Everything else <laughs> can be in the glove. I don't need anything <laughs> else. I just need to feel that trigger. <laughs> and I can keep my hand in my pocket there and keep everything warm. <laughs> but then I can, I can find my string, find a loop, hook it up. I don't have to look because it isn't a caliper that you know closes around it. It's just a little hook. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I like yeah, those yeah, that way. I didn't have that problem in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> It don't get that cold. <laughs> no, no. We got one mountain range that gets snow on it. Um, and that's way down south. Um oh. where I live, the coldest it gets is about oh, I'm gonna talk Celsius, so I don't and I can't I don't know how to change it, but probably around here it probably gets to about eight degrees Celsius uh in the middle of winter, and that'd be with a wind chill factor. <laughs> um, yeah, at night. Zero, zero's freezing, so yeah, you're yeah. you're about forty five maybe. Yeah, something like that. Oh, fair enight. Um, but then during the day it's you know twenty three. So I don't know what that'll be. Um, but in summer it's just hot, you know. Yeah, if it don't get cold, it's it's gonna be really hot. No, yeah, we, we just get hot. <laughs> you don't want to be. In, <laughs> just you never want to come to Australia in summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds like it. 
<laughs> well, we were in Korea and everyone was whinging um, how hot it was. It was like 30 degrees or something like that. And um, um, all the Americans were whinging and everyone's undercover and, you know, in the shade and all that sort of stuff. And there just happens to be four dumb Australians standing out in the sun having a chat. <laughs> <laughs> We hadn't even noticed. <laughs> Meanwhile, even the Arabians are in the in the shade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, eight oh. Celsius is forty six degrees Fahrenheit. There you go. So what's forty degrees? That'll be interesting. Because that's our average summer. One hundred and four. There you go. One hundred four Fahrenheit. Yeah, so about yeah, hundred degrees Fahrenheit is our average summer, which is a bit tropical. Yeah, <laughs> and then you probably have a fairly high humidity too with it, don't you? Oh, the, yeah, it'd be hundred percent humidity. It's it's funny when you walk outside of the air conditioning, the, the heat hits. It's a physical blow. <laughs> you can actually feel it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would that would be tough. Yeah. I think winter yeah. time would be the time to come to Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, especially for uh, people from Nebraska, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a heat wave. I, I yeah. remember one time, a uh, place I was working, the, the main office was down in, in Florida. And I'm going down there in the wintertime. Of course, leave from Nebraska. I, I have my suit and I have one of those sweater vests on and my tie. And, and then I have my winter jacket. I, I get down there and I left the winter jacket in the motel. Like, I don't need it. And no. they was talking about it. It's like, well, it's really cold. It might not let your car, it might not want to start too well. And they let it warm up. You got wussy cards or what? <laughs> you know, this is heat <laughs> for us, you know. <laughs> so I go walking in. Yeah, I'm I'm driving there in, in my suit. You know, I do have a sweater vest. It's like, you know, wearing a sweater and my, my suit coat. And yep. I was just fine. And one of these guys come in with a great big park. It's like you use in the Arctic. Great big old heavy park with the big old hood and the big fur around it, the face all bundled up. And then it's like, what are you doing? But he's, he's used to being so hot. You know, 40 degrees was cold for him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was yeah. freezing. <laughs> freezing for us. <laughs> Heck, in the wintertime, when it warms up and in the uh, the the 20s or 30s were out in t-shirts <laughs> yeah see you guys are mad absolutely <laughs> mad <laughs> well <laughs> when, when it gets so cold when you're walking on the snow it crunches <laughs> oh well the, the wife wanted a, a white christmas this year because you know I, I saw snow once um <laughs> from afar and uh <laughs> She's a bit pretty much the same. And um, so she wanted a white Christmas. And I said, oh, fine, you know, wherever you want to go, just book it. I don't care, you know, just tell me where we're going. So she, she's booked us for two weeks going to Lapland, um, which is basically the Arctic Circle. <laughs> <laughs> Does she realize how cold that gets up there? No, no. Um, she's... She, She's slowly working it out because they've spent us a, sent us a special list of all the special clothing that we need. Um, so we're going to spend three days in Helsinki, I believe, just shopping um, for, the, for the appropriate it, wear. It could easily get down to minus 40. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was funny because I was in Korea and I was, I was talking to Martin Damsbo from the Netherlands. And I said, mate, um, you know, give me the inside line on um, what gear I should be getting um you know what's the good brands and you know all that sort of stuff that actually works and um he just started laughing he said mate it doesn't get that cold in the netherlands i wouldn't know <laughs> <laughs> oh, so yeah i'm i'm in trouble there i'm in big trouble <laughs> she wanted a white christmas <laughs> yeah so yeah we got a white christmas all right <laughs> It's going to be good, though. I think we spend a couple of nights in one of those glass igloo things and watch the aurora and all that sort of wonderful stuff. So trip of a lifetime. Um, yeah. Yeah, but um, well, I'm going to be freezing. 
it's gonna be nuts. So <laughs> yeah. I think I'm just gonna take the car battery and <laughs> attach it to myself. <laughs> well, and the the hard part is you're not used to the cold, and it takes a while to acclimate to the cold, and it never gets cold enough there. We're here, you know, when when it starts, you know, summertime, it starts getting down into the 60s and 50s. You're like we're putting goats on, and in the middle of winter time, though, it gets up to 50, 60. We're it's like 40, 40s and 50s. We're outside with t-shirts on. We don't spend yeah. a lot of time out there, but I won't drive anywhere without having nice winter coats. But yeah. you know, if I need to, you know, take the trash or something, it's like I just walk out. It's like because you're used so used to being cold, and then it warms up. Yeah. Well, see, I, I do that ice bath thing because I'm old and broken, and uh, it helps a lot after a competition to just go and sit in that thing for five minutes. But I basically told the wife, I said, it's going to be like sitting in that thing all day, every day. <laughs> it's going to be cold. Yeah. Yeah. But like I said, uh, trip of a lifetime. Yeah, yeah. I'll send you some photos. All you'll see is this guy walking around in this massive hoodie parker and two eyeballs. <laughs> walking around like this <laughs> with six layers on. <laughs> make sure and you have sunglasses hmm? make sure you're wearing sunglasses yeah, yeah they said that because you get frozen eyeballs and all sorts of stuff um, well not all that the glare off the snow yeah because you get you just glaring right into your your face and then you know call it snow blind because it, it the sun is shining down reflecting off of that you know just yeah. take take in, in you know where you're at take a, a white car and let the sun shine on it and then try and look at the car. Yeah, feel like welders flash. Yeah. 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 Oh, that'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun. It'll be so fun. what do you what do you do for your, your day job? The day job, I am a project manager. So um I work for a non-for-profit and we build medical centers here in um Queensland. Um yeah, been doing that now for Ooh, 15 years always been in the health side of things always built you know building medical centers and all that sort of stuff um uh, really young when i first came out of school i was managing pubs and clubs and hotels and stuff um but then yeah got into the building side of things and i'm no builder i just i'm good at telling people what to do <laughs> <laughs> well the project manager doesn't have to know how to do everything just needs to know who they need to call to get it done. That's it. That's all I do. That's all I do. Is just make sure, sure everybody's getting it done when they get it done. done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that which is good. It, it pays all right, it pays for our trips because um we're not funded in well, Archie Australia fund us a little bit. Um, but in Australia, because it's compounds not a um an Olympic event, the government don't um fund it. So it's quite funny. The recurvers get funded, get government funding and all that sort of stuff. And um, the poor old compounders get very little. Um, Arts Australia pretty good, though. They try and help where they can, but obviously they can't use government funds where it's not supposed to go. Um, yeah. And stuff. <laughs> you get in trouble for doing stuff like that. So, you know, this year they funded us um, some accommodation and stuff like that, which was good. But as a whole, normally we um, have to pay ourselves, um, which is another thing with the, you know, we got some really good youngsters who can really shoot. We just can't afford the trips. Um, yeah. It makes it hard. It makes it really hard. Um, fortunately, at the moment, we've got a really solid team. Um, and most of the kids can afford the, afford the, the uh, trips or their parents can. Um so yeah, the future's looking good anyway. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Now that the old guy's out of the way. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of nice when when they can get you know a little little help from from something so you don't have to foot the bill all yourself. But you know, they 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 take plenty of money or taxes. It'd be nice to give it back to somebody that's good for something like that. And instead yeah. of yeah. you know, give it to people for doing nothing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we always laugh because, um, um, you know, our government gives aid to some of these countries and then you turn around to a, a, go to a World Cup and their arches are fully sponsored. And you're thinking, 
How does that work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're sponsoring your competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, always makes you laugh a little bit. Um, because if you didn't laugh, you'd cry. But uh, yeah, it's it's one of those things. You know, we know straight up that we're not going to get much funding or or um, stuff like that. So if you choose to shoot a compound, that's just the way it goes. Um, one day it might end up in the Olympics. Who knows? Um, probably as an indoor sport, I reckon. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're constantly, you know, they're they're looking at adding new sports and stuff all the time. Yeah, and I don't yeah. know we we really talk about it all the time, and you know, I suppose you could always do outside compound and you know just bring the targets closer and all that sort of stuff. But we always thought, you know, because the pistol shooting now is down to just air pistol. I think, um, I think all the other ones have been taken out. There's not a lot of shooting events left in the old Olympics, um, which is a bit sad. But um, yeah, you could do you know indoor archery in the <laughs> in the pistol in the pistol range, I suppose. But um, yeah, I think that's the only way they can get it in is do something completely different from what the recurvers are doing. Something like that. Yeah, it's you know it may get in. Who knows? I yeah. know. Um, <laughs> You know, in skating, ice ice skating's been in there for you know a long time, and then and then uh, they started looking at getting roller skating in there. And yeah, I, I was actually here and I participated in uh, one of the exhibition ones for the Pan Am Games in speed skating. And, oh, really? and then was used then was using quads instead of the inlines I do it now. Uh, yeah. They went back to the original skates, roller skates, the inlines. <laughs> Yeah, everybody thinks it inlines the new fangle thing. No, that's the first patent <laughs> roller skate was in <laughs> back in early 1800s. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, that was that was uh, uh that was fun and a lot of a lot of do that good stuff. And then now it's an actual event and and then I started doing the short track. Yep. And and they advertise they show that a lot, uh, you know, in the winter games. Uh, but if you ever seen the ice short track. They copied that after the roller skating. Oh, really? Yeah, there's a hundred meter track and an oval track, and and so that it looks exactly like what I used to do. <laughs> it's exactly like the only difference is they're on ice with blades, and we were yeah. on on floors with eight wheels. <laughs> That's it. Well, <clears throat> well, this I think in Paris they've got break dancing as a Olympic sport. Yeah. Okay. Uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this kid's they listening. Break to this. They can put yeah. compound yeah. bows in. <laughs> break dancing is cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny because break dancing was cool in Australia in the you know, I think early eighties. That was about it. <laughs> yeah. I don't think anyone's done it since. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I, I never got into doing that kind of stuff because I think I was too old when that come along. And yeah, it I'm I'm not I'm not getting down on the ground because it takes me too much work to get up. <laughs> yeah. I can get down, it's just getting back up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give them this. They gotta be fit to do it, but I, I don't know how it's an Olympic sport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never know. <laughs> Never know. Hey, Mike, <laughs> we might be break dancers next week. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll put, I, I'll, I'll I'll next. <laughs> any break dancing I'd be is because I broke something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'd be a bit like me, mate. <laughs> Last time I went for a walk, I met all these new people, <laughs> the, the ambulance drivers. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 yeah very unfit very unfit well i'm not a little bit cardio on archery so what was that i said there's not a lot of cardio in, in archery <laughs> oh no no there's not unless you're doing an outdoor 3d because then there's a lot of walking <laughs> yeah that, that's it that's it yeah that's but, the walking um, <laughs> 
I think if I ever did any deer hunting, it'd be from a, a tree stand. I'd be naked otherwise. Oh, yeah, I I I like hunting out of a tree stand. Well, we have a lot of trees around here, so um, well, actually, two places I have don't have a lot of trees, but I mean, you know, most most of deer hunting around here for archery is done out of tree stands or some like the blinds. Um, the blinds are nice in the winter time because they block a lot of the wind. Yeah, yeah. But I still prefer to be up in a tree stand. I can see so much more. I can see them coming in instead of like, oh, there it is. Um, <laughs> no, you didn't stop where I could shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, I don't have a window over there. I can't shoot. <clears throat> How does it work over there? Um, are you allowed to bait them in or you know, all that sort of stuff? Or is it just different for no. state in, in some part? Or... Well, here in Nebraska, you can't put bait out. You know, if you have yeah. if you have salt blocks or mineral blocks or anything, it's got to be gone. I think thirty days before the season starts. Um, oh, yeah. You know, if you have feeders, you can't hunt within so many yards of a feeder. You know, you yeah. can have the feeder there, but you can't hunt over a feeder. Yeah. Um, so we just don't do it. Not there may be other states that have different rules. I don't know all the rules for all the yeah. states because. I don't hunt in them. I just hunt Nebraska. <clears throat> uh, just explain some of the memes I see about guys, you know, sitting in their tree stand with a uh, uh, 20 pound bag of corn. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. Personal consumption. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, you know, in the farming process, you know, if they spill corn or anything, that's just part of the farming process. And I I know a, a friend of mine. He he did the combining for you know. He took the corn out and and he accidentally spilled some. As it's going around the corner, by his tree stand, of course. <laughs> <laughs> accidentally, farmer says, "I know you're hunting this year." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's gold. Mm -hmm. We don't have anything like that because everything we hunt is feral. So it's all, it's no holds barred. Kill them all, whatever way, which way you want. It, yeah, um, especially the hogs, man, they, they can get really bad. Oh, yeah. And they make, they do a lot of damage, um, a lot of damage. But um, it's funny because um, most of the the pig hunting here in Australia, it's done by dogs. Um, ninety percent of it, anyway. And um, those guys are fit, <laughs> chasing chasing them down on foot. That's just yeah. madness. <laughs> <laughs> and then wrestle them to the ground and stick them with a knife. He's <laughs> just going, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, That's a young man's game. <laughs> yeah, must not be very big hogs then. Oh no, they're big hogs. They're just mad guys. Um, they basically get, you know, the dogs grab them from each side and um, basically, you know, protect the hunter from the, the tusks. And then he comes in, grabs them, you know, sticks them a few times. Those yeah. boys are mad. Those boys are mad. Yeah. Give me a uh, a very large caliber from a long way sitting in the, in the back of my truck. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. I, I see some videos of guys, you know, uh, shooting them from, you know, night scopes. You know, oh, the yeah. dogs are out there and then they just, doop, doop, doop. <laughs> nope, nope, and yeah. just shooting it from the distance. They'll, they'll run off and then they'll come back. And... Yeah. yeah. They're not real bright, the old pigs. Um, we're not allowed to have silence. And so one shot and they're, and they're gone. So a lot of the stuff, if we're going to shoot them, a lot of times we'll get a few guys together and we'll just run around in trucks um and stand in the back of the trays with shotguns yeah and basically when, when when we're doing a proper cull and it's not out there for sport it's you know we're just culling we'll just get a big line of trucks and go through a whole field you know all lined up and um the rule is you just you know you basically drive up on the pigs and just shoot them point blank <laughs> it's not very sporting but uh it certainly works on getting rid of the population well, it's like when you got mice in the house, you put a trap out. Mm. You just, yeah. it's the same thing. You're eliminating a pest. Yeah. It's just, yeah. 
you can eat the hogs. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if I want to eat a mouse. <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't want to eat the, the pigs around here. They've, they've all got worm and all sorts of stuff in them. So uh, oh, yeah. a, lot of guys, a lot of guys trap them and then they'll feed them on grain for six months um, or so and, you know, worm them and all that sort of stuff. Um, but most of us uh, <laughs> don't really want to eat that sort of stuff. But, yeah, you, you cut them open. They're just riddled with tapeworm and all sorts of stuff. Oh, yeah, you don't eat them then. No, no. So it's just uh, a column. I did see uh, a video a little while ago. Some guy in the States, he's uh, mounted a minigun to his truck. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've <laughs> seen videos of them shooting from helicopters and everything else yeah. just going by and choo -choo -choo, just shoot them as they're going. They're running, just yeah. shoot them. And... That'd be fun, shooting them out of a helicopter. Already going to be hard, but it'd be good fun. Yeah. Um, this guy, yeah, had a minigun. I think he was a Texan. Had to be Texas, I reckon. Um, with yeah, a laser. probably. Yeah, yeah. With a laser pointer, shooting them at night. <laughs> it was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> you just see these pigs just disappear <laughs> in a cloud. <laughs> In a cloud of red mist. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one way to get rid of them. Yeah. yeah, they're real destructive. Oh, apparently there's no such thing as being overgunned in Texas. <laughs> Too much no. gun. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, we always used to laugh about that. If you you know you have the permission to shoot your kangaroos or something like that, you'd been pig shooting. And then you pull out your 30 30 or something and shoot a kangaroo with it. <laughs> it was overkill. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it don't take much to kill the kangaroo then, huh? No, no. Uh, a well placed headshot, you could do it with a 22, I think. Um, but yeah, I think most of most pig shooters use a um, 2 3 or that. Um, you call it something else. I think you call it the NATO round or whatever, but yeah. Yeah, five, five, six. Yeah, five, five, six. That there, you can't tell the difference really at looking at them. There are slightly yeah. different in them. The five, five, six is a generally a little bit heavier bullet, a little, little more power behind it. Yeah. And the two, two, three is a little bit lighter load. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. But yeah, there's pretty much nothing in Australia you couldn't, you couldn't kill with a two, two, three um, unless you're up north shooting. Cape Buffalo, then you need something a little bit bigger. Yeah. I don't think <laughs> I'd want to go after him with a 223. <laughs> no, no, no. We usually use elephant guns for that stuff. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not Thank sure you. I'd even go with my odd six. I think that might be a little bit light. Yeah, no. Um, I've got a mate who does it. I think he uses a 4570 lever action. That does yeah. a job. Um, there's a round that doesn't give a shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you got to be somewhere up there. You know, 500 Weatherby Magnum, that's about where I'd start, I reckon. <laughs> it's something big. They're a big animal. Big animal. But yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's the only thing we've got. And well, you do we have a variety of things to, to hunt and fish and all kinds of Sorry? Different stuff. To, you do have a lot of a lot of different variety of things to, to hunt and fish. And... Yeah, so like I, we do a lot of fishing. I think there's not many Australians who don't fish because um, we're surrounded by water. Um, so we're good there. Hunting, yeah. Well, we've got a bit of deer now. There's a lot, a lot more choices there if you want to go deer hunting. Yeah. Um, We've even got the fence that crap now where you can go and shoot them in a fence. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's not hunting. That's just good. That's just getting fresh meat. Yeah, that's get oh, they put GPS trackers on them and all sorts of stuff now. That's yeah, I don't I get don't get that one. But um um so there's there's a bit of bit of choice there, but mainly, you know, if you're just going out the out the back of bush and on a mate's cattle property or something like that, you're just shooting pigs. Um, that's about it. Feral goats, goats are bad here, um, up north especially. Um, but they're dumb as hell. They'll just stand there and look at you while you shoot the whole herd. 
<laughs> That's more target practice than anything else. Yeah. Um, you can't eat them. They taste like crap, so you can't eat them. It's just what they do is usually is they kill a heap of them, pile them up, and then come back a few days later and shoot the pigs. <laughs> oh, yeah. That works well. But um, at least we've got nothing around here that'll hunt you or eat you, um, except the sharks maybe, but um, nothing on the mainland that'll actively hunt you. <laughs> Not like you guys have got. You've got bears and I mean, all sorts of crap, mountain yeah. lions. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, we don't have any bears here in Nebraska, but we do have lions. Yeah, see, no, not not a um, big population, but we do have some. Yeah, so that counts me out. <laughs> yeah, we make I, up I've for seen it. a couple. <laughs> we make up for it in uh, the snakes and spiders that'll kill you instead. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> man, at least of them, but not too much. Breeds. On the Western the trees, Nebraska, right? you got the rattlesnake, but oh, really? Yeah, not really what much here on this end, but see, we we got snakes everywhere, even in the cities, just snakes everywhere, <laughs> and not the nice ones either. But you know, it keeps you on your toes. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, you never know where they're going to be at. Yeah, and we're not allowed to kill them either. That's the that's the funny part. You got the poison snakes, and you can't kill them. No, not allowed to. <laughs> it's like the crocodiles. The crocodile um, uh, population has exploded in Australia. They're everywhere, um, and they're, they're still protected. We're not allowed to kill them. So we've got to wait for a few more American tourists to come over and get eaten, and then they might change the rules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think the last. Well, I'm one not going to volunteer for that that job. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the tourists, though. They're always the tourists. Um, well, it seems like, like some of them they they're just not smart enough to figure out. It's like I, this is a wild animal. This one can eat you. I want to <laughs> get a picture with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there's a big sign saying crocodiles don't swim here. <laughs> Yeah, so they go to swim anyway, mm. and they wonder why they get eaten. It's hilarious. Yeah, and sometimes that... not too smart, but uh, hey, you know we've well, been we've been talking for about an hour and a half now. So, oh, cool. Well, yeah. there you go. I was worried about filling in the time talking about me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm not that excited. Wait till this guy hears me. He goes, "Oh God, <laughs> I've got a dud." <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it always it always goes it always goes longer than what what I allow for it, but I do normally allow an extra hour afterwards just because sometimes it go long. But no, that's right. You can edit all the crap out of it now. You'll have a good ten minutes in there. <laughs> oh, I don't edit podcasts. Oh no, I don't. I just upload them live. <laughs> well, not live, well, but I mean, I just upload them. Upload them as they're recorded. Well, this will be interesting. If you say something stupid, it gets in the video <laughs> or the audio. Well, I'll see how much hate mail I get after you after you um, put it up. That'll be funny. <laughs> yeah, it'll go um, on my YouTube channel. Yeah, uh, as well as the audio part goes on Spotify, and oh, I cool. think Apple has there's uh, Audible. You can also listen to the podcast on Audible. Oh, that's awesome. Go out there, go on audible, audible.com and search for Arch Talk 101 and, and you can listen to it there. Um, yeah. as well as in the Arch Talk 101 Facebook group. Um, I'll upload the video there since I couldn't go, it didn't let me go live for some reason no. again. Um well, that's, that's, that means we didn't get any hype while we were doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you get I'll get a message from Rio later going. Stop telling people I know you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> if they don't like what you said, I guess they can come on the podcast and talk about themselves then. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> get him on next. to go, oh, that pricey guy, he's a wanker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll love you and leave you then. Yeah, and any final thoughts before we go? 
oh, look, mate, I just, I, I like this sort of stuff. People putting it out there. You know, I'm retired from the international stuff now, but archery has been one of those things that's given me so much. Um, met so many people, really nice people. I've had such a good time doing it. Um, and I'm not going anywhere. I'm still going to, you know, shoot nationally and, uh, and probably keep, I want to give back to the community that's given me so much. So I'll get into the coaching now that I'm getting a bit older and all that sort of stuff. Once I learn how to shoot a hinge properly, <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll teach others how to do it. <laughs> that is one thing. If you're going to teach how to use one, you need to know how to use one. That's it. That's it. I might become a specialist on um, taking punches and, and turning them into shoes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, so I'm looking forward to that part, and um, I'm probably going to try and stay away from the committees and all that sort of stuff. I'm, I don't do well with that sort of stuff. I get the, I get the irrits, and then I start telling people what I really think, and it always ends up. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that works out. Sometimes that doesn't. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't. But no, that's that's basically what I wanted to say. Like, if, if anyone's listening to this and they're you know thinking about getting into archery, do it. It's a great sport. I love it, and um, it's a something you can do forever. I like you know, fifty three. You can start at five, and I know guys in their eighties that are still shooting. So it's a great sport for that. Yeah, and and I'm by the time I'm ready to start get back into it, I'll be getting closer to seventy. So I'm sixty nine now. March I'll be 70 and it's going to be a while before I can even draw my bow back. Yeah. yeah but that's right the best now thing. I'm still, still restricted. I can't even lift much. No, nah. but that's the thing that once you can start pulling your bow back, it's going to help you recover a lot faster. Oh yeah. Um, you know, it's one of those things uh, I always say, you know, I'm very fit from the nipples up. <laughs> <laughs> well that's kind of what archery does right you can use that one right you can use that one <laughs> oh. yeah i guess i hadn't heard that before but that, that's pretty funny <laughs> yeah yeah you just gotta be careful who you say it in front of <laughs> yeah yeah, you just <laughs> sat in front of a whole bunch of people. Oh, well, that's right. <laughs> I live in Brisbane. I'll pick you up from the airport if you want to come and whinge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all good. Thanks for the opportunity to have a chat, mate. I'm sorry it took so long. Um, oh, I know no, that's, that's fine. It's, I, I had him go anywhere from 45 minutes to four hours. Yeah. <laughs> I was getting, talking to him, he's like... Man, we've been talking for four hours. Jeez, and, you know where did time go? You just get going, and and yeah. you know, I try not to go that long, just because it gets kind of long, and then yeah, yeah, you watch people you know, try to keep it an hour, an hour and a half, just just because that gives us time to chat about stuff and, and take tangents and <laughs> and, and <laughs> come back. <laughs> hey, well, I don't, I don't mind taking tangents. It's it's all it's all fun. You know, we just yeah. get to talk and and well, we you know. managed to stay away from the politics and the religion, so that's a good that's a good move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we kind of stay away from those, but you know, hey, yeah. wherever you want to go is fine with me. No, no, you no. know, <laughs> yeah, no. I don't want to tempt fate there. No, all good. Well, mate, thank you for the opportunity. It was very enjoyable. It was good meeting you too. Hopefully yeah, it was nice meeting you and, and see you at a Vegas uh, shoot or something. Yeah. Yeah, it's we'll uh we'll have to keep in touch and let me know how things are going and yeah, you know, maybe maybe when you come listening, to... you can follow me on my Facebook page. <laughs> Helps the sponsors. They love the sponsors love Facebook page, Instagram, follow me. <laughs> yeah, what I'll do is um I just go ahead and send me the, the links for those and I'll put them in the description. Make right, it yeah, easier yeah. for them to find you. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, that way they can get a hold of you and you send me the links, then I don't have to try and track them all down and yeah, no, no, make I'll sure I get the that. right one. <laughs> you know, sometimes <laughs> I'll look up at somebody's name and it's like, okay, here's four profiles. They're all different. <laughs>
they're different ones. Which one is the right one? And, and then you have to look at it like, oh, okay, they're an archer. Okay, that's this. <laughs> you know, or whatever. So yeah, just send me the links in, in Messenger and, and I'll add them to the description. And and oh. I'm going to put on the YouTube channel. I'll put them in the description there for it as well. And and cool. you'll go from there. And and it's been it's been a lot of fun <laughs> talking to you. And well, mate, if you ever want to chat again, give us a call. Too easy. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll do that. Maybe we'll catch up a little bit later when you have something exciting going on. We can Yeah. Yeah. You know, get ready to go to the Vegas or something. Maybe we'll we'll chat. You know, oh, that's a good get ready idea. to go to Vegas or after you get to Vegas or something and yeah. and let us know how it's to go in there and Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Like <laughs> I'll go on um crash tackle Rio and get him on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey. Anybody wants to come on, you know, it's that I I don't restrict it to any specific person. It's like if you've never shot a bow and want to learn, hey, come yeah. on, you know, we're ready to talk. You know, or, or like you, that's been an international archer or, or semi pros or professionals or Olympic archers. Um, uh, I mean, talk, you know, to to different vendors and you know manufacturers yeah. and uh, of different items. And hey, it's like we start talking archery. That's all we care about. You know, let's let's yeah. talk archery and go from there. And, and and those that have businesses, we promote the businesses on here, and whether yeah. it's archery or not, you know, just because hey, you know, let's let's help each other out. And, yeah, no, that's great. It's a great way to do it. Yeah, excellent. <clears throat> Talking about businesses, I better go and do some work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got a medical center to build. <laughs> oh yeah. So what time of day is it there? Uh, right now it is eleven forty one a.m. Oh, okay, because it's eight forty two here. So, yeah, you're you're you you better get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, mate. It was good chatting to you. Yeah, good good chatting with you. Um, my name is Rory Canterbury, and I've been your host today on Arch Talk One Hundred and One. And we had our special guest Scott on here, and we enjoyed talking with you. At least I I did anyway. Enjoy talking with you, and we'll catch you later. See you, Mike. See ya.